Hello once again. I haven't made any videos on LCD TV repair for a while, so I figured I'd better rectify this situation. You know, ever since I started producing these videos, I've gotten an awful lot of phone calls at the shop here from people asking me what's wrong with their TV based on the symptom they're having. And as much as I like to be helpful, it's really not a good idea for me to guess at what's wrong with your set. I mean, I really need to take the time to analyze a circuit or your TV and find out what's going on, which board quit working. A lot of these new TVs can really be confusing when you're working on them. For example, you may have a TV that doesn't come on. You may automatically assume that it's a power supply problem because it's not turning on. Or some people will go to the trouble to tell me what they think's wrong. They'll tell me it's just a switch because it won't turn on. And that isn't necessarily going to be the problem. Uh, what I have in my hand here, for example, this is a power supply board with a, an inverter board attached to it. If this inverter board goes out, it'll actually cause the, sh the uh, power supply to shut down. And I see this sort of thing a lot with these new TVs. Um, since a lot of the people that have been writing me don't really have much background in electronics, let me recommend a, a book that's helped me out a great deal. I purchased this book years ago. It's called Getting Started in Electronics by Forrest Mims. Mr. Mims really took the time to make this book simple. It's not going to overwhelm you and make you want to give up at the first page. He's uh, drawn an awful lot of pictures in this book. And hopefully my camera. Uh, things that I find very digestible, and I think you will too. I'd also like to recommend a couple books that I put in my info section. They're e-books. One of them is by a gentleman named Justine Young. It's on switch mode power supplies. I absolutely love his book. He really took the time to explain all the different circuits, how they work, how to troubleshoot them. He put a lot of pictures in the book. And the other gentleman, uh, John Preher, he just got done finishing a book, an e-book that is, on um, LCD TV repair. He also took the time to put a lot of pictures in it, a lot of diagrams, and uh, I find it extremely helpful. Uh, if you're tip, new at this or if you're trying to improve your troubleshooting skills, um, a lot of times you'll have a component go bad on a board, and you may not know how to test it. For example, uh, you may have an opto-isolator, which is used in a feedback circuit. If it goes bad, you're not going to know it just by visually looking at it. you got to run a test. you got to take your volt ohmmeter out and see what kind of resistance it has going across the different junctions. And what I recommend is that you start taking notes of different boards that you've worked on. In fact, let's just say you've got an old junk board laying around your shop somewhere, and you see parts on it that... Uh, well, like a transformer or an opto-isolator or diode, and you want to see how it checks on your meter, write it down. Write down what kind of resistance you have going across the different junctions. And when you go back to working on uh, another set at a later point, you'll be able to look at the uh, readings you had off a particular component and see if there's a similar reading just to give you a general idea what to expect. I know it's going to be difficult to know what, what every uh, component is going to read, for example, with resistors, you can't expect every resistor to read the same. They're not supposed to. And you can't really expect every uh, diode to check the same, but you'll see common characteristics. For example, if it's a Schottky diode, it's going to have a, a lower voltage drop across the junctions versus a uh, more conventional diode. So things like that can be extremely helpful. Another tip I'd like to leave you with is to save all the old components or all the old boards on TVs that you work on regardless of whether you're able to fix them or not. A lot of times you'll have old junk boards laying around your shop that may turn out to be extremely value, valuable to you at a later time. For example, an inverter board. This particular inverter board had a bad transformer on it and it would have been cost prohibitive to re replace the whole board on this particular TV. But the other day, a friend of mine in the business came in here. He needed one of these transformers. I happened to have it. He was able to get the TV going. In this particular case, believe it or not, the manufacturer required him to buy this board and two other boards. They wouldn't even sell him just the transformer alone or the inverter board alone. They actually required him to buy all three boards, and it would have been about $1,600. So for a, um, a $20 transformer, he was able to get the thing going. The other thing I was going to say is a lot of these TVs are amazingly complex when you're talking about the main board. Um, a lot of these ICs on this main board, you're not even going to be able to buy regardless of whether you can figure out that it's done. Yeah, you won't even be able to buy in a lot of these ICs, even if you could figure out what was wrong with them. 
What you can troubleshoot on the main board are some of the easier to troubleshoot components like the capacitors. This board is loaded with them. Uh, it's very common for capacitors to go over bad around a scaler IC. Uh, the other thing is you have crystals on this set and these uh, books I mentioned in my info section tell you how to test some of these uh, devices like the crystal you can check, the voltage regulators you can check. Uh, you can also check to make sure you've got power going to the ICs, things like that. But hopefully you'll get lucky and you'll get a lot of simple problems that involve just uh, simple uh, power supply problems or inverter boards that you can troubleshoot. Again, you run into a problem with some of these inverter boards where the components are mounted on the back side and it's a little bit difficult to unsolder, not impossible, and sometimes hard to find the parts. So. It's not always going to be an easy fix, so you want to learn all you can to make it as simple as possible. In this part of the video, I thought I'd talk a little bit about taking voltage measurements and why it is you need to understand there are two different ground reference points used when you're measuring voltage. Let me see if I can explain that to you here. A lot of times you'll open up a schematic on a circuit board you might be working on, and the manufacturer will have little notes on the schematic indicating what the voltages should be, various parts of the schematic, or various parts of the circuit board. For example, it might say there's supposed to be 10 volts on this end of the resistor and 5 volts over here or 20 volts over there. You always have to have a good ground reference point with which to measure from and you need to make it sure it's the correct ground reference point. For example, the manufacturer may say that it's okay to, or the schematic may show that it's okay to measure from the negative side of the capacitor here to all these other points. But what if there's a different ground I need to measure from? How would I know which ground is the right one? Well, if you look at a schematic, sorry about the poor artwork, you'll see that on the schematic itself, there are different symbols indicating ground. For example, this is a ground symbol, this is a ground symbol, this is, this is, so is this hollow triangle. Now, these two grounds here are isolated from each other. There would be no connection between these two, electrically speaking. However, this ground would be connected to this one, and this one, and this one, whereas all the hollow triangles would be connected together. And the reason they've got two different symbols there was what, what they're trying to tell you is that the two grounds are isolated. The hollow triangle you see here is often referred to as a cold ground or an isolated ground or a floating ground, whereas this other ground is referred to as a hot ground. And the reason they would call these grounds hot grounds is because they're hot in relationship to one side of the power coming in here. Whereas, as you see here, this is completely isolated from anything over here. Now, if you know anything about the way transformers work, they have pulses coming in on the primary side, and it induces a voltage on the secondary side, but there's no actual electrical connection between the two. So if you were going to measure anything on this side here, you'd have to measure from your hot ground, I'm sorry, your cold ground, to get any correct readings. It's not all uncommon for people that are new to the business not to understand that, and they'll They'll pick a ground reference point to which, with which to measure things from, and they'll notice they don't get any voltage on the other side here, on the isolated side. So anyway, that's just one little tip that might help you. And uh, one other thing, oftentimes the manufacturer will actually show on the board itself, they'll section off a certain portion of it with paint, just to let you know that this is an isolated section from this other section here. And if you are measuring voltages, make sure that you're taking into consideration that you've got an isolated ground. One other quick warning I want to tell you about here. When you're measuring voltages on a transformer that's being driven by high frequency pulses, you never want to measure from this ground reference to this side of the transformer. These high frequency pulses can actually damage your meter. Actually, I don't know about these modern day meters. I've got a fluke meter that seems indestructible. But I remember when I first got in the business, I measured across a transformer on the wrong side. Instead of measuring on the rectified side, I measured on this side. And keep in mind, this isn't 60 cycle AC. This is being driven by a high frequency uh, pulse width modulator IC. And uh, you don't want to damage your meter. So again, always measure on this side.